No. Okay. Let's hope it records. Okay. So thanks a lot yes, for. Yes, it is. <laughs> thank you. Okay. So thanks again for 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 the invite to be here. And my today's theme, post digital science and education, is it is a theme which is really relevant and important in our pandemic times. So I look forward to presenting and to discussing first. Uh, this is a screenshot of my website, which is basically just my name and surname.com. So it's peteriandrich.com. Uh, there you can find many articles and many sources that I will be talking about. I will not give uh, specific links and so on, but all these links can be found on this website. So if you are interested in anything uh, that you see or hear at this presentation, you can go to the website and you can find all the relevant information there. Speaking of the concept of the post-digital, the majority of uh, early theorists of the post-digital agree that their inspiration for the concept has come from this article written by 1998 by Nicolas Negroponte in the famous, in the famous uh, magazine, The Wired. Here, Nicolas Negroponte says that uh, the, sometimes defining the spirit of an age can be as simple as a single word. For instance, he takes the example of a, the film, The Graduate, where the young Bre ben Benjamin Braddock, played by Dustin Hoff Hoffman, accepts career advice by another colleague. And this guy tells him, well, the future is in plastics. And Benjamin asks, well, what do you mean? And Mr. McGuire says, well, there's a great future in plastics. Think about it. Can you think about it? And now that we are in this future, in the year 2020, uh, plastics is not a future anymore. Plastics is all around us. I'm drinking my tea from a plastic cup. Uh, my computer is made of plastic. Even I think that my shirt has a bit of plastic inside, although I don't like uh, shirts which have plastics. So the thing is that plastic is all around us and we don't really feel it anymore as something unusual, as something new, as something different, as something special. Now, in 1998, Nicolas Negroponte asks, uh, is the digital designed for the same banality? Is the digital designed to stop being new one day and to stop being all around us? And he answers, certainly. Because it's literal form, the technology is already being to be taken for granted. And its connotations will be tomorrow's commercial and cultural compass for new ideas. So he compares the digital with the air and with drinking water, meaning that being digital is not something unusual anymore. It's something that we get all around us. When I was visiting Beijing, I was, I was stunned. I mean, I live in Europe. and digital, We have a lot of digitalization here. But the level of digitalization in China is just unbelievable. You know? Like I want to try to rent a bike in the street, but you cannot rent a bike if you don't have a credit card. And it's all digital. So basically, without being digital, you cannot really be a proper citizen anymore, almost anywhere in the world, but not just in Croatia and China, but literally anywhere in the world. A few years after, the first mention of the concept of the post-digital, the, the first mention of the word for post-digital came from this article, which is in front of you. It's called The Aesthetics of Failure, Post-Digital Tendencies in Compu Contemporary Computer Music. This article was written by Kim Cascone, who is a theorist, but he is also a musician. And Cascone speaks about his, his experiences with computer music where he would set up a computer and he would try to play some music on this computer, but the music would not really, 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 really play perfectly well. And why would not the music play perfectly well? Well, because there were some technical problems. Cascone calls this, these technical problems glitches. It's a technical glitch. Like you try to do something, like I tried to, 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 to record, and then the Zoom told me, you cannot record before uh, the host uh, gives you the permission to record. So I had to stop all the people who are listening to this, to this dialogue to request for the permission. So this is a glitch. The te technique did not really work 
smoothly, but I had to do something in order to make it work. Now, Casconi had the same problem with the music. He would do some computer music and then his, his computer would crash. And then there would be this kind of glitches. And Casconi developed something that he called the aesthetics of the glitch, where basically Casconi says that within those glitches, within those spaces where technologies break down and technologies need human help to actually, to actually start working again, we have the combination of the human and the digital together. So we are in a digital environment, but then we have a human, human nature surfacing into the digital environment through the glitch. And Kaskoni calls this the post-digital. The post-digital with the idea, not after the digital, but with the idea of a, a, a combination between the digital and the non-digital. So this is the first article which explicitly mentions the word post-digital, and it was published in the year 2000, almost exactly 20 years ago from today. From then on, uh, the concept of the post-digital has entered the, the, the various aspects of art. So what you have in front of you is proceedings from the third computer art congress, which was dedicated to post-digital art, only just a few years after Cascone did published his paper on the post-digital. So here it's not just about music. Here is also they write here they, it's also about culture, economy, society, and cognition. And cognition implies, of course, education as well. So they speak about humanization of digital technologies, about post-digital art. And of course, they mention Nicolas Negroponte, who is their early, early, early person who actually, uh, who's the first person who mentioned the term. Moving on, we have another conference uh, quite a few years ago asking, can a new culture grow from post-digital art? Because what we have now is not anymore just uh, the question of the computer or the question of technology or the question of even arts. Because, you know, arts tend to stay in artist galleries. Arts tend to be something fairly exclusive. Arts tend to be something that actually is kind of... Well... Many people consume art and many people produce art, but art is still not, it's still quite elitist. So uh, in comparison to this, they ask, can a new culture grow from post-digital art? And when we speak of culture, then we don't speak just of one aspect or one segment of the society. When we speak about culture, then we obviously speak about the whole society. Then we speak about something else then from studies of technologies and from studies of arts, we slowly move to studies of the human condition, to studies of social and other, other, other aspects of human, of human life. I will show a few more. Uh, this is the Institute of Network Cultures. It's uh, quite a famous in institute in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands which has been heavily engaged in working with digital cultures for many, many, many years. They were probably one of the first centers in the world, historically, who, who took technology, computers, digital issues, digital questions into the context of cultural studies. And of course, they have something called the post-digital blog. So if you can see here, it says first post-digital art, post-internet art, new aesthetics, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. And here in this post-digital blog, what they're doing, they're actually exploring some of these aspects of this, of this new or newly, newly found or newly developed post-digital understanding of the world. 
And here we can see slowly, but surely, how the concept of the post digital moves from the context of art to the context of cultural studies, so to the context of humanities. Now we are speaking, now here is 2013 symposium con on electronic art, which also speaks about similar things. And I, meant, I, I put this slide here, not because I wanted to go back to the questions of the arts, but because of these names. Here you see that the chair, somebody called Florian Kramer, then below somebody called Alessandro Lodovico, and so on and so on. And these people, back in 2013, are people who will, just, just a year or two later, who will actually push the, the, the post-digital idea and the post-digital thinking from the narrower concept of the arts into more broad, in, into broader, into 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 just different right concept uh, area of the humanities and social sciences and this is my next slide so this is a journal which by the way has a great name it's called the peer reviewed journal about and then in each issue they it's about different things so actually the title of the journal changes with each issue it's a wonderful concept i I'm not aware whether the journal has done anything recently, but in 2014, uh, those three people on your screen, Christian Ulrich Anderson, Geoff Cox, and Georges Papadopoulos, have edited uh, an issue about post-digital research. And here they say, they describe the post-digital it has that it neither recognizes and so on and so on. But we'll talk about these this, 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 uh, definitions later, so I will not read them at this point. But if you can take a look at the, at the table of contents, and it's not the whole table of contents here, there's more down there, but I cannot scl scroll in, in, in PowerPoint. You can actually see that they're asking some really, really important questions, such as what is po the post-digital, horizons of the post-digital, uh, post-digital propaganda, prehistories, so they're looking into some histories of the post-digital and so on. As far as I, I know, which is not completely safe, but as far as I know, this is probably the only, uh, the first uh, mention or elaboration of the concept of the post-digital within the so-called sciences, the so-called humanities, and, 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 and social sciences. The next one I want to show you is Alessandro Lodovico. That's why I showed the slide a few slides back, we, who speaks about post-digital print. So he speaks about the mutation or the, if you want, transformation of publishing since 1894. Now, what does this say about, about about this. First, the post-digital idea is not just about what happened in the last 20 years. I mean, he goes back actually for more than one century and he speaks, so he starts in the late 19th century. And he actually speaks about the whole systems of different ways, radical different ways, how we share and how we distribute our information. So, speaking about the post-digital here, we are actually speaking not just about not just about the, the the human condition and so on, but we are speaking about a certain relationship between the human condition and technology in ways which enhance each other, and also in ways in which they change each other, in which they transform each other. So, of course, digital technology transforms print. But it also transforms my own practice of reading. Because now, when my colleagues from Beijing sell me something, I don't need to wait for the book for two months. I just get an attachment, and I read this attachment. It changes my personal life. It changes my professional life. It changes the way how I see and how I 
understand uh, life around me and how I live. And that's a crucial thing. You see, the next book I will, I'm, try, I'm showing you here is the book about post-digital aesthetics. And it's really interesting because if you take a look at the subtitle, the subtitle has three different terms. The first term is art because the editors, Dave Barry and Michael Dieter are still very much interested in the art. But then they have computation. Interestingly, not, not, not informatics. They have computation. They, have, they speak about machines which do a lot of logical operations. And then they have design, which, which is kind of an overreaching, overreaching thing which, can, which touches both technologies and of course, and of course the audience. The other slide I would like to show you here is something which is interestingly called the Museum of Post Digital Cultures. So what are we talking about now? We have something which is at the time I took this screenshot when so when when they did this website, it was about 2010 or something. So there's something what is 10 years old and it already has its museum. I mean, it's really funny, and it's especially funny for, 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 you know, for China with its five thousand years of history. You know, it's something ten years old, and get its own museum, right? But, but the idea about doing a museum of post digital cultures is not so much about showing what happened in the past. It's also about preserving things which are in the present. And it's also here, this Museum of Post Digital Cultures, this website, is actually more or less the, 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 the collection of some of the events that they did and some of the exhibitions and so on. So the name is much more ambitious than actually what's inside. But still, again, if you, th if, if you think about the idea of a museum, what is a museum? A museum is a place, it, it, you cannot show everything in the museum. There's somebody who is curating the museum. There's somebody who is choosing what goes into the museum and what goes out. So the same thing is with, is with post-digital cultures. We somehow curate them. We somehow, with post-digital cultures, we create them as they unfold and as they develop in front of our eyes and in correspondence with us, so in, in, in dialogue with us, in interaction with us. So this event here that we are now having and where I'm now speaking and somebody else will reply and I hope that many people will reply from the audience and then we'll have this discussion. It's a typical, it's a typical post-digital situation. It's a typical situation of post-digital culture it's yes i'm croatia yes you're in china yes i work at the school of informatics you work at the school of Info of education and so on and so on and so on there are so many differences between us but then there's so many things that connect us as well and the post digital focuses to this to this interplay between the things that that, that separate us and the things that bring us together when I was going to China last year, I was, you know, it's a 10 hour flight from here. So you are in the air for 10 hours to come to Beijing. It's a huge distance, it's a huge way. And yet we are so close at the same time. So we are very, very, very far and we are very close at the same time. This is also one of the post digital ideas, how actually the concept of distance can change through the usage of technology. Okay, so in 2018, the concept of the post-digital has finally kind of entered a bit, bit even deeper into, 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 into mainstream of uh, the humanities and the social sciences. And this is one example where the University of Coventry in the UK has actually launched its own center for post-digital studies. Obviously, this is a screenshot that you cannot link on, click on, 
But if you're right, just Coventry Center for Post Digital Studies, you will find the website and you will find many projects that are working on and so on. When I was doing this presentation, I was not aware that there are a few other post digital centers around as well. Uh, just maybe two hours ago, I gave a very, very similar presentation for a wonderful post digital center in Leipzig, in uh, Germany. So the idea is that I that those centers, this is just one example, but those centers are actually popping up. And because they're popping up all over the world, you can be sure that pretty much soon, if not already, there will be a similar center in China. I'm terribly sorry, and I especially felt it when I was in China, that I cannot understand Chinese. For me, Chinese language is really difficult. I tried to learn a few words, but, but it was really, 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 really tough for me. And I cannot read Chinese as well. So a lot of Chinese web, for me, unfortunately, is not accessible. But if you take a look at the Chinese web, and if you take a look at the places which, which, which all this beautiful research which takes place in China at the moment, I'm pretty sure that you will find at least a bit of post-digital work over there. I'm aware that there is something going on in Guangzhou as well, so I'm sure there's something going on in Beijing as well, but of course, as I said, for me, it's very hard to access, so I'm not really sure. Well, I, I can't really tell you much more than that. For those of you who are interested in post-digital thing, this is a wiki, which is the website called monoscope.org. So it's M-O-N-O-S-K-O-P dot O-R-G. And this website has a huge repositorium of early post-digital material. It has things such as recorded recordings from, 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 from conferences. It also has a bit more serious articles. It has, it has many, many different things and it has a selection of books. Now I would like to emphasize that this selection of books is not really all there is. There is a lot of good post-digital work that was done after years 2015 or 16, when actually this place was last updated. But still, for those of you who are interested in early history of the concept of the post-digital, I think you, you, will be, you will be, this is probably the best source available at all at the internet that exists. So it's my wrong, warm recommendation if you're interested in these things to take a look at this website. So I have been reading this for many years and then I was thinking, okay, so what can we do? And in, in 2018, I collected a bunch of friends. So it's Jeremy Knox, Tina Besley, whom you know, she works at uh, Beijing Normal University together with Michael Peters and others, Thomas Ryberg, Juha Sorante, and Sarah Hayes. And we wrote this article called Post Digital Science and Education. What we did in this article is that we examined 20 and more years of development of the concept of the post digital, starting from Nicolas Negroponte's views in his VARD article, and moving on through all these sources I actually showed you. And what we did here, by the way, the paper is in open access. So you just write the title, it comes up, you can see it, it's free of charge, you don't need to pay to access it, you don't need to pay to read it. And it is available in China because I checked it when I was in Beijing. So uh, in this article, we provided an overview of the past 20 plus years of, 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 of the concept of the post-digital. But what is more importantly, we started developing our own theory of the post-digital, which we thought at the time 
would be very, very important to develop and to do for in and for the, the times and the place where we live now. And soon after, the, with the same group of people, we started the journal called Post-Digital Science and Education. I'm journal's chief editor, editor-in-chief, but all these people, all these co-authors from the, the, from the article that, that I showed in the previous slide are actually journal's co-editors to these days. So we are not only business associates, we are also very good friends. And I'm proud to say that we work pretty well over the years. So we started the journal in 2018. The journal today has almost 200 articles. We explored, our authors explored the concept of the post digital from numerous, numerous, numerous perspectives and so on and so on. Again, for those of you who are not so interested in the history of the concept, but for those of you who are interested, especially how to, in the concept of the post digital, but especially how to apply these concepts to some problems of education, then I would suggest you to take a look at the journal. Again, no lot is a free charge. Again, it's accessible from China. So you can really do it very, very simply. Write post digital science and education in Badu or whatever is your search engine of preference. And actually you will find it in one of the top in one of the top results. So this is the journal that we started in 2018. And we did quite a lot of work about the journal. Together with the journal, we also started the book series. I'm also editor of the series, but again, there's uh, all these people are also in the back together with me. And what we are doing here, we are trying to develop and collect and find and eventually publish sorry, some good books in the field. And I think it's hugely important because different communities, different people have different traditions and different ideas about what they would like, uh, how they would like to, 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 to read, but how they would like to write, you know? So some people prefer reading books or articles. Some people prefer writing books and other people prefer, prefer writing articles. And I think it's, <coughs> excuse me, I think it's hugely important to somehow, to somehow offer uh, what we call a whole rounded publishing ecosystem for post-digital literature and for post-digital thought. So I will not promote my own journal and book series much further. Uh, there is a link here. You can also Google it and so on. But if you have any work uh, in, in, in uh, this field, I would very, very happily consider it for publication. Just a few days ago, literally two days ago, I received a book which I co-edited with some people from Beijing Normal University, just give me a sec. So this is, so this is the book. It's called, opa, it's called Knowledge Socialism. And if you recognize the, the, the editors, one of the editors is your dean, Zhu. So we, I work a lot with Chinese scholars. Uh, we published many Chinese scholars, both in the journal and the book series. And we will be really, really, really happy to consider good work coming from your school into the journal. But okay, end the book series. Let's give this up and let's talk about some definitions. So, an early 2014 definition says that post-digital, once understood as a critical reflection of digital aesthetic materialism, now describes the messy and paradoxical condition of the art and media after digital technology revolution. So the post-digital neither recognizes the distinction between old and new media or ideological aff affirmation of one or the other. It emerges old and new, often applied network and cultural experimentation to analog technologies, which is re-investigates and reuses. It tends to focus on the experiential rather than the conceptual. It looks for do-it-yourself agents, DIY means do-it-yourself, outside totalitarian innovation ideology and for networking of big data capitalism. 
at the same time, it, it has already become commercialized. So this is an interesting point because what they say here really is that the post digital is not necessarily just after the digital. This is just one of the meanings. But the post digital is a critical reflection of the digital. And I think it's a much more important point. According to the other definition, which is a bit older, the post digital is intended to acknowledge the current state of technology while rejecting the conceptual shift implied in the digital revolution. The shift apparently is abrupt as on of zero one logic of the machines now pervading our daily life. What did they talk about here? That here, they talk about the idea that the computer works on zero one. So you have either one or zero. But human body does not work like that. Your eyes, your hands, your face, skin, organs, ear, they don't work on zero one. The biology works different. So we can acknowledge the state of technology, but we do not necessarily need to say that everything should be digital. You know, like, for instance, digital books. You have a book on the paper, like the one with Dean Zhu. And it's a book of the paper. It's continuous. And then when you digitize it, then you make this book as a series of zeros and ones. Now it becomes a series of zeros and ones. But not everything in this world is zeros and ones, and not everything can be digitized. So I cannot digitize your beautiful smile, here, for instance. It's impossible. It cannot be digitized because it's something else. So that's, that's this continuum between the digital and the analog, which is so important. So here there's a longer one by Florian Kramer, who is one of the key early theorists of the post-digital, saying that the post-digital can be defined more pragmatically and meaningfully with the popular cultural and colloquial frame of reference. I am not going to read this big one. Uh, I read the shorter ones, but basically it implies, he says that the prefix post should not be understood in the same sense as post-modernism or post-histoire, but rather in the sense of post-punk, like something still punk, but beyond punk. Or post-communism, I live in Croatia, which used to be a communist country. And China is still a communist country. But Chinese communism in 2020 is very different from Chinese communism in 1970, for instance. So we cannot speak about post-communism. It's post-communism, but it's different than what it used to be. So the same is like with the post-digital. It does not imply that we negate the past, that we say that we are now different, completely different. But again, we are different. So this is, this is the kind of the continuum to, uh, uh, about, about the word post. And so many people have written about it. Many people have said, you know, we have this problem with the post-digital, that problem with the post-digital. There were so many issues which have been addressed about the concept of the post-digital, that people at one point have become somehow bored and tired of all these questions. And then Florian Kramer, in one of his scholarly articles, wrote this definition, which, 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 it's not dirty words, it's not swear, swearing, but it's unusual. He says that the term sucks, but it's useful. Why does it suck? It sucks because the term is burdened with many, many, many problems. People understand the post in many different ways. And you cannot really just say, ah, okay, you know, the, the, let's use this word just like this. I mean, if you use the word, you need to be critically uh, examine this word, what it means and what it may mean to various people. But then again, it's useful because with all these numerous problems with the concept of the post-digital, it still describes the contemporary human condition or the contemporary the, 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 the reality that it tries to describe in much better terms than some other competing concepts. So that's the idea. 
what the, 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 the takeaway, the moral of this first part or second part already of the presentation is that the term, the concept of the post digital is very useful. But we also recognize that the concept has a set of its own problems. And it, these problems are quite deep. Uh, if somebody is interested, I can point you towards several articles written about it. Some of them are, these articles have been written by Michael Peters and Tina Bessler. Some of them have been written by Jordan Zou and by some other people from Beijing University, like Liu Ying. So people all around the world have critiqued, and people from deans to research assistants. So and on all levels of education have actually critiqued the concept. But still, it's a useful concept. And because it's still a useful concept, then we said, okay, we will still kind of say that we will move forward with this concept, that we will accept the concept with all the problems that it entails, because it gives something. So speaking about the concept and moving away from critiques, uh, one of the main challenges of the concept of the post digital is the biological challenge. Now, the biological challenge, uh, Dyson in 2007 wrote that it has become a part of the accepted vision to say that the 20th century was a century of physics and the 21st century will be the century of biology. I think that I need to stop here, pull over, and unpack this statement a little bit because I think that this statement is hugely important. 20th century, 1905, Albert Einstein gets his Nobel Prize for special theory of relativity. Bohr gives his model of atom. We have whole development in physics of elementary particles, nuclear physics. We have the atomic bomb. We have the Second World War ending with throwing of two atomic bombs on Japan, on Japanese cities. We have the Cold War after the Second World War, where Russia and the U United States of America compete in space race and also compete in nuclear weapons. All these competitions, all these things are physics, nuclear physics, space physics, whatever. We have the advent of the computer vacuum tubes, transistors, microchips. We have, we put more and more processing power in less and less space. So now my computer, which you cannot see because the, 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 the camera is on it, physically in it, but it's a small laptop computer. It's huge space power, it has huge power. It has more power than, than, than the computer used to land person to the moon. And we got all this, and all this is physics. All these questions about biology, uh, sorry, about uh, the digitalization and so on is physics. So what we did in, in the West, what you did in China in the past 20, 30, 40 years, we digitized, we digitized libraries, we digitized journals, we digitized almost everything that we could put our hands on. And when we digitized things, we basically took artifacts such as the book, physical artifacts, artifacts that you can throw away and make bang into something invisible, into bits and bytes, into something that can be transferred through the wire, into something that could be transferred through this, through the internet. But, in 1996 or 7, we had cloning of Dolly the Sheep. We had genetic engineering. We had, we did the genetic roadmap of genes. Chinese scientists did amazing contributions in genetic research. And what happened? 
we arrive to this biological challenge. After we digitized all the books and after we digitized everything, now we are trying to go from digital code back into life. So what are we doing now? What are the Chinese doing now in terms of computing? It's artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence is basically means that you take a digital, digital physical machine and try to make this physical machine think and function as a human, as a biological entity. So first we had the digitization of biology, including mapping the genome. But once we did that, we now have the other way around. So as Craig Venter says, we have been digitizing biology and now we are trying to get from this digital code into a new phase of biology with designing and synthesizing life. So now we are trying to ask, can we regenerate life or can we create new life out of this digital unit? In the 21st century, there's more money in biological research than in physics. In 21st century, some of the most important uh, uh, areas of research have not been in physics anymore. They have now been in, in, in biology. And of course, you all know what happened in Wuhan and now happens all over the world. We have COVID at the moment. Thankfully, as I hear, China is pretty much free of COVID at the moment. Congratulations. Your country has done an amazing job in containing and working with the virus. And I really admire Chinese skill and Chinese ability to deal with such hard things. But we are not exactly of the same luck around here. Last week we had grandparents, my partner's parents came over to see my son, their grandchild. And they came back to Split, where they live, to the city of Split, and they both have COVID. They are okay, it's fine, but biology. So what happens? It happens that biology is now the key thing in the post-digital condition, especially now in COVID-19. Who cares about elementary particles and about the next accelerator of particles? Who is racing? to understand in the space race. China is not, America is not, Russia is not, but they are now racing and our countries are now racing. Who will find the first vaccine for COVID? This is the race. This is the place. This is so biology is currently the challenge that we, that we are facing, the biggest challenge that we are facing at the moment. So 20th century has been the century of physics, and the 21st century by now is the century of biology. And that's a hugely important thing. That's a thing which determines the post-digital condition. The post-digital condition is not about computers. The post-digital com condition is about the combination of computers and biological form of life, about the combination about computers and biology. Okay, and now I will come to our own definition because of course, we once we started the journal and once we started the research group and so on, we, we, we came up with this definition. And I need to thank, especially thank, I know she's not here at the moment, but I need nevertheless to thank Tina Besley, who also works at Beijing Normal University with you, who, is one of the authors of this early article that we wrote and who made a huge contribution to the following definition, which is on our screens. So it says, the post-digital is hard to define. Of course, it's hard to define. We don't have the words for that. Messy, unpredictable, digital and analog, technological and non-technological, biological and information. The post-digital is both a rupture in our existing theories and their continuation. So it breaks with history, but then it also continues the history at the same time. 
However, such messiness seems to be inherent to the contemporary human condition. For instance, the current, the current crisis of academic publishing or whatever results from messy relationships between pre-digital understanding of intellectual property and digital ways of creating and disseminating content. Remember when I showed you this black book with the called post-digital print? So this is the early example. This book, again, I'm showing it, written with your dean, it's called Knowledge Socialism, and the subtitle is the rise of peer production, collegiality, collaboration, and collective intelligence is one example of this. And it's a hugely important example as well. So uh, the well-documented challenge of communication of education is not caused by digital technologies, but its main aspects, including but not limited to automatic assessment, cannot be thought of without digital technologies. So the idea is that with this definition, we try to cover a lot, but more importantly, we try, <coughs> excuse me, that we do not close the door for something that could be much more, that could be potentially important in the future. And based on this definition, we created a research program. And the research program says that the post-digital challenge is all around us. So in public discourse, it unfortunately ended up with a name that carried some bitter baggage. But the term may provide historical continuity, help us learn from earlier technology theories, and perhaps even avoid an odd conceptual trap. So the post digital shows our raising, opa, sorry, shows our raising awareness of blurred and messy relationships between physics and biology, all the new media, humanism and post-humanism, knowledge capitalism, and bio informational capitalism, and as your dean would probably say, knowledge socialism as well. And this is the point. We, 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 the concept of the post-digital is not a fixed concept. It's a concept which is in flux. It's a concept, concept which develops all the time. And it develops an interaction between people coming from various places. And I will show you something here on the screen, just because I think it's important. So when you take a look at the, at the journal, Post Digital Science Education Journal, you will see that we have people from many countries. So where do we have people from? United Kingdom, United States, who is on the third place? China. Because those are the places which develop. We cannot do science and research anymore by being confined within the, 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 the confines of something which is, which is uh, just to one country or whatever. What we need to do, we need to cover the whole world. And now I have a few things to show. What I have now is various papers and various things that came out of this. So we have the discussion of the post-digital humans. This is the new book, which is going to be about the post-digital humans. Uh, Michael and Tina wrote a hugely influential paper. This is the most cited paper in the journal in all times, of course, Michael and Tina, who wrote this. Uh, it's a hugely important to be critical about these things. Brain data, again, biology, right? Post and compost, speaking about the prefix, post-digital design and practice. What does the post-digital mean for education? I think that we are gonna talk about it a bit later, right? I think that we are gonna talk about the post-digital in education. Post-digital perspective on organizations, post-digital dialogue, religion, some cartoons. And basically, I will just, maybe five more minutes, I'll just wrap up very soon. Uh, about nine months ago, I issued a call for papers for various uh, papers related to COVID-19. So please allow me to outline a bit of history. As I already said, in December 2019, I was visiting Beijing Normal University and I stayed in close, close touch with my Chinese friends and colleagues. So when the corona exploded in Europe in February and March, I already had a pretty good feeling of what had happened. 
In early March, I wrote an emergency editorial for post digital science and education. And I also launched the call for various types of COVID related papers for the journal. So during the past months, we published almost 60 articles on COVID-19. We launched the collection of uh, a few weeks ago and so on and so on. And the Sarah Hayes and I wrote recently, it's a true history of our historic present, uh, pandemic present. So last week I was writing an overview article. I was thinking, okay, so how can I connect things that people have written in those 60 papers? And I classified the main themes and challenges and ideas, post-digital ideas about the COVID into three large groups, lived experiences and their responses, politics and philosophy. So philosophy is important because it gives us a sense of what is right and what is wrong, as well as our own responsibility. Politics is important because it tackles burning problems of collective decision-making in the age of fake news and post-truth. Documenting our lived experiences of the COVID-19 pandemic as teachers, learners, and human beings, it is crucial to make sense of our post-digital COVID-19 reality. So responding to these experiences for our nervous systems of neoliberal education is a natural and necessary move. Yet we do need to think of ways to, in which we will conduct our classes this afternoon and tomorrow morning remaining within the confines of our current educational systems and social infrastructures would be a missed opportunity. So it is our duty as educators to move beyond the narrow focus of education and technology and address human problems in their entirety. Both digital theory is conveniently positioned between the analog and the digital and also between various traditional disciplines to address challenges related to COVID-19. Obviously in the face of the COVID-19, the bioinformational aspects of post-digital theory have ended up under the spotlight. However, I would argue that the key contribution of post-digital theory is not in these theoretical matters. In my view, post-digital theory does not stop at explaining the world. Its goal and its key mission is to actively participate in the development of the world and to enable the widest spheres of the society to participate as well. So in relation to the corona, the post-digital view has obviously been very important. And again, the COVID issue of post-digital science and education, his papers by people like Michael Tina and Diordine, amongst other Chinese. We have Chinese scholars from almost 10 universe, different universities there. So it's not just BNU. But the thing is that I'm really, really happy with the opportunity to present this in front of you, to outline some challenges and to outline some possible perspectives to the post-digital. And I'm especially interested in this China-Europe collaboration and dialogue, because I think it's hugely important for developing the concept of the post-digital further. So I will now stop. I will thank for the attention and I will ask for your questions. Thank you very much once again. Well, uh, thank you so much, Professor Peter, for uh, this wonderful holistic overview of this post-digital ideology, I would call it. It's definitely critically relevant to every aspect of our contemporary life. Um, we are on time for our schedule. So uh, without, uh, without in much interrupting, let's welcome Professor Zhang Jingjing for her comment on, uh, on your presentation. Okay, thank you. So thank you, Peter, for bringing us such a very insightful and informative presentation. I learned a lot. Thank you. So, yeah, so I'll read, I'll read more articles later on. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about um, what we have, we have done in the past in our research project in response to the concept of post-digital and also COVID-19, what we did during, the pro, uh, during that period of time. So I think before COVID-19, so conventional education or mainstream education seems to only deal with right, human relationship, like between teachers and students and students and students, or those group interactions. So, so, so digital technology has been regarded or understand as an extra or some supplement or addition or tool to mediate or enhance pedagogical practice or learning experience. So this, this is to say just before COVID-19, so mainstream education has not been seen itself as 
digital, right? So that is very difficult to understand post-digital as a very meaningful concept, but which we really need to because we've been experiencing such a, such a period of time that all the universities and schools have moved classes totally online. And, and this gives us an opportunity to, to be completely digital or gaining digital experience in the past few months. So such, in such experience, I think rather than saying the use of technology as something separate to our practice, educational practice. So educational practice were embedded with these digital technologies. So we as educators or students in the field of education should really aware that the understanding of technology in the current situation or especially in post COVID-19 are changing. So I, so I think we are experiencing a period of change in our relationship with digital technology, higher education and the broader society, right? In China and worldwide. So it, as the use of digital technology have to some extent embedded within our social practice. So for example, we have conducted a critical discourse analysis or MOOCs in Chinese higher education institutions, which was published in Learning Media and Technology. So we found the prominent thing that emerged from the higher education discourses is the, is the theme of change. So Chinese higher education institutions consider MOOCs as change first, then pedagogy or technology. So MOOCs is not just a technology or platform or a course. Students probably consider it's just a course, right? I can, I can learn, I have access to university's resources. But, but when we analyze those higher education discourses, we connected from, 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 about, from about like 500 of those documents. And we found actually the, the institution itself perceive it as a change, but it's not a change, it's not a technological change. It's actually, it's a change to our educational practice. So, so, so the perception, the, the understanding towards those things, those informed by the post-digital concept, I think really help us to shape our practice in the future. So for example, if you understand MOOCs as a technology, what you're going to do, you are going to really develop technologies or, or improve technologies. If you understand MOOCs as a course, then you will put more effort or energy into the design of courses, like, like course design. But if you see it as a change to our educational practice, conventional educational practice, then I think that's a good sign that that we are going to enter into a new, 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 new age, right? So, so, so I think in the current moment, like nowadays, more attention needs really to to be given to understand this human and technology relationship practically and philosophically. And with regard to this point, I think the term post-digital may provide a very useful concept framework to understand the current and future practice of education in China and worldwide, which I think long time ago, we were really taking the technological determinism or, inst or instrumentalism, same technology as a driving force to education or technology as a tool to, to use in educational practice. So we're changing, we're gradually changing our, our, our conceptual framework to understand the educational practice. Um, so, but, but how I think um, with regard to how the post-digital -digi discourse response to our educational practice in COVID-19, I think from the digital uh, post-digital perspective, it, I think we will not assess whether online learning is as e effective as classroom learning, as the nature of such education forms is different. So digital or online technologies were not used as interventions or tools that can be tested in experimental studies. So understanding of digital technology as a tool or strategy leads us to prove which form is better, which online, whether online is better or face-to-face or -face learning is better. But we forgot actually the understanding of technology in contemporary time, especially in the period of COVID-19 are changing and we are entering a new, a new, a new, a new, a new stage, right? The online learning has proved to be the only possible solution for us to contain the spread of, of virus. And our experience has shown the learning online is different. So, so in our research, we, we actually advocate 
like in such a new learning experience, we need to really think what is different. So we were, we were advocating that the cost of online learning is different, not, not just only pay attention to technology. So as lots of online learning programs are free from economic perspective during the pandemic, so the more the better, and learning at low cost, those mindset is forming. So students actually are under great pressure, pressure to cope with all these ever increasing education resources. So which seems to help realize education equality. So, but, but you know, we have only limited capacity to process information and, and attention has to be regarded has, or regulated to prove, to prevent the information process system um, from being uh, over, overloaded. So our team at Faculty of Education have taken an open a and network system perspective to understand connective attention in, in this digital, digital society. And we have published several articles in computer system language learning and uh, another one in the distance education. So, so we're trying to really um, propose understanding the real costs of, of our educational forms in band with technology can help us to design better learning resources and learning experience that will incur lower cost when it comes to learners' attention. Um, and also, I think digital divide is also not a new topic for the virus breakout, but, but in our research, it also doesn't mean just mean access to education. It further refers to the openness of online education or online resources. But it is important to ask to what extent these learning resources are actually open to learners and whether online learning is unfortunately constrained by some new form of distance in this online space. So our research has shown that the structure of the online learning space. So we were actually saying this kind of learning provided online as a learning space. And, and we propose flow distance between different learning resources defining our connective attention model as something that really affect the, your, your success of learning. So, but, but, but we still need more theoretical work of online, distance, of online distance education and to really further strengthen our current practices. But, but I think taking the post-digital perspective, especially after COVID-19, the public in China, the public and private educational partnership could grow in importance so, so low sign that stakeholder, no, no single stakeholder is able to make this possible. And diverse stakeholders, including governments, publishers, educational professionals, technology providers, and, and also those kind of network operators all should come together to solve the problems of online learning and hope this partnership will not go away, but become a consequential trend to our future education. I think I think this is very important and, and also the concept post-digital is really bring us kind of new conceptual framework for us to understand, to re-examine our current educational practice. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Professor Zhang, on your sharing for your work during this COVID time. Of course, that is a huge disruption to education systems all over the world. And, uh, you know, as a staff member at BNU, we experienced this firsthand. And um, I'm just very curious, like uh, Professor Zhang Drake, would you like to comment on uh, Professor Zhang's reflection, you know, how on the policy level or how a practitioner's level, this ideology of post-digital can be utilized in uh, in a concrete like company or in a, in the school or in the policy? Well, I would like to agree with so many things. And I would like to talk more with the professor because I think we have so much in common that it would be wonderful to do something together. Uh, yes, I will first point just towards a few points of agreement. Uh, when Professor Jing Zhang said that it's not just about technology and learning, it's about the transformation of the whole experience. I mean, just the idea that we are now sitting where we are in these times where, you know, China was locked down, Croatia was not. 
Now China is not locked down, but Croatia is. Maybe at some point both countries will be locked down or maybe both countries will not be locked down. The idea is that the experience that we are having is not just the experience of anybody, you know, my experience or your experience or experience of the learner. It's simply human experience at this historical moment. So the experience for, for students is one thing. But what about the experience for teachers? What about the people who need to speak into the stream? And what about the experience? I was just looking a few minutes ago. I don't know if anybody noticed, but actually my son just went over in behind the screen. He's seven years old. He cannot go to school. He is at home. My partner is also teaching at the university. She she is giving a lecture in another room, also on Zoom. And he's seven years old. I mean, he is very well behaved. But, you know, he needed a toy and he just passed over here, you know. So that's private and public coming together. So it's not just about educational experience. It's much further than educational experience. And I think that Professor Jin Zhang did a very, made a very good point that we are need to make these partnerships, not just between Croatia or the UK or China, but also between private sector, governmental sector, tech companies. Uh, simply there needs to be different, deeper, a better kind of collaboration within various stakeholders within the education system. And I think that it's hugely important. I think it's hugely important that we uh, somehow develop ways and somehow develop connections which will actually enable us to do this thing. And you know, and I know, that relationships are not something that's built overnight. You cannot just come one day and say we have a relationship. But if you work together for years, if you do things, seminars, people talk with each other, whatever, then you can actually slowly start for small things maybe build something something bigger into the future. And the post-digital perspective is good because it enables, creates a common ground, which can be a very useful starting point for creating those various kinds of, not just be between professor from China and professor from Croatia. It's nice, but it's boring. But, from, but with professors and somebody working in the tech sector, or somebody working somewhere else, much broader than just us. And I think that I think this is something that I would I completely agree with the professor Jin Jiang said. And I only think that we should emphasize that we should strongly emphasize this part on collegiality, collaboration, and working together, collective intelligences. That the future will not be in any of us working individually anymore that the post digital future will be in synergies in coming together thank you peter right uh let's see if we have questions from the chat box Right, I see uh, Sarah here. Um, maybe she would like to hear more about your data and like what is your samples and how do you construct your data in uh, your research on MOOCs in China, Professor Zhang. Professor Zhang? Okay, yeah. Uh... Would you like to talk a little, I, I know that you shared your paper here, but it might be a little bit more straightforward if you can just go over that very briefly. Okay. Uh, so maybe I'll just uh, share a little bit of my uh, screen screenshots. Okay. Just uh, of just... course. Um, Um, so, so we published article uh, "Modern Access MOOCs and Changes in Chinese Higher Education." So, in in this in this research project, we um, 
collected about 500 online documents from 74 Chinese university websites. Um, that's before 2016, and those are the universities that offered MOOCs at that time. Uh, we adopted critical discourse analysis in order to really understand how MOOC is perceived in the process of discourse practice um, in China. Um, so this is just a little bit descriptive analysis, like, like different, different categories of universities and different types types of documents. For example, there are something news and policies and interviews. So those are public, publicly available on their official websites. Um, and, and so we adopted a fair, fair Commons critical discourse um, framework to understand at the, at the text level, to really understand how um, they use lexicalization to, under, to perceive MOOCs as something else. For example, MOOCs as change, MOOCs as course, MOOCs as technology. We also did a little bit analysis on transitivity, mood, and other sorts of tech, linguistic at linguistic level and how those those different texts was used. And then at the at the process analysis, we interpret and how those documents were produced and who produced and for whom they produce. So because um, they have the potential, right, the, the audience. So in critical discourse analysis, you're really trying to understand um, while on paper they write in such way, but why they the underline those, those underline the, 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 the text, the theme emerge from text, but why they, they, they present in such a way and whom they really talk to. And they want to persuade what, what kind of audience to believe or to, 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 act, to act. And also at the social analysis level, we're trying to interpret and the differences between different Chinese higher education institutions. And in order to really in explain what we find um, in MOOCs, we need to really understand like, like education informationization, which is a policy led by MOE like for, for, for about 50 years to, because MOOCs is, is, is it was, was re first, uh, invented in North America by Unit University, but but when it was introduced to China, it's kind of part and continuous process of our educational informationization, which is similar to dig, dig, uh, educational digitalization. But we use the term education informationization, and I think that's that's a term we use. So so in our study, we find, as you can see on the on the left, the themes. Issues and meanings associated with MOOCs, change, pedagogy, global phenomenon, scale, and and, and the most uh, pr prevalent definition justi justification of MOOCs is change. So MOOCs as a source of change, but which is a change to educational practice, not a te technical change, and also the pedagogy, the impact of MOOCs on pedagogy. So in China, those universities really see MOOCs as something well will reconstruct the, our conventional face-to-face -face teaching and learning, and also seen as a global phenomenon and a scale. So this is the four, four, four things, like we found the top four things. But we also looked at the overlexicalization. Uh, I thought this is really interesting because we know MOOCs was emphasized as as offered by Init University, especially first in North American, and they are high quality courses and uh, provided or taught by leading professors. But you can see actually, overlexization is means that you use different terms but similar meanings to 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 describe those things again and again. So 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 why this phenomenon is is happening or is occurring to MOOCs? Then we need to understand actually the history of our online education. Like traditionally, it was rec recognized as not good education, right? Like if you cannot go to the conventional higher education institutions, then you take the online form, like traditional the TV and broadcasting education. So, so, so that's why it's not good because conventionally it, re it was regarded as not good enough. So that's why when this kind of new form was, was, was was uh, attract attention more widely than they really emphasize the good quality of it. Um, so, so we really need to take 
take, take critical perspective to understand, not just that because it said it's good, it's high quality, so it's good enough. So we need to think critically and how really to help it to, to, to make use of it to really to realize the educational equality. Um, okay, so I think that's um, there are more findings, but I think in this slide, I was using these slides yesterday to talk about research design. So if you, you want to know more about our research findings, you can read the article. I can share another some, some other slides or send me an email, okay? Thank you very much. Right. This is, oh, this is brilliant. I really like it. Sorry, yes, excuse me. No, I, no, I was just trying to direct it back to you. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, there's, there's right. nothing, I mean, I critical discourse analysis is really Sarah's specialty. By the way, Sarah is one of the associate editors for the Post Digital Science and the Education Journal, and we gave this presentation, another presentation together today, so we kind of work together a lot. So, so this is not exactly my field, but it looks really, really, really great. And I, I would, I would agree with the idea that the MOOCs, that MOOCs have not been considered as good enough, but they have been measured against the wrong standard, right? Because it's not just like you said, you cannot really compare these things. I mean, there, there needs to be something else. It's, it's, it's a very different experience and. We should be aware that the post-digital condition, which I'm coming back again to it, that, 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 that it creates experiences which are maybe not so easy to compare. You know, there is a word called, from quantum physics, called incommensurable, which basically uh, speaks about two concepts which may have equal value, but are simply not comparable. Like in Croatia, we want to say, like if you want to compare apples and oranges, you know, you cannot compare it. It's two different one. It's just, it's two different types of fruit. So yeah, so yeah, I really, I really appreciate this, this what you showed us, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's it's because I think it's happening a lot, like people really seeing it as technology as a tool or as an intervention. So that's why they compare. They think you, they, you, you add a little bit to our mainstream education, you, you you introduce a little bit strategy, you introduce a little bit intervention. So that's why you can compare in experimental studies. But if those are something really different learning experience, then re we really need to kind of look forward to future form edu of education and to, to, to really provide better support to our learning experience. Definitely, definitely. Now I... Um, my colleague prepared a question. Uh, I'll connect. I'll contact her to see if um, Professor Peter and Professor John could give the explanation and answer. With with pleasure. Yeah, just a second. Is this the question in the chat? I want to ask Professor Jendrik one question. The differences between post-digital education and digital education. Is it this question that I'm just reading now in the chat? Yeah. Uh, I think I'll the question, right? Come to the question in the chat box. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, Professor Yandrik. Okay, well, uh, there's a short answer and there's a long answer. I'll start with the short one. Uh, the concept of the post-digital implies this combination between the digital and the analog. It, it, it's not just about the digital. It's wider than the digital because it implies transformations both within digital systems and within biological systems, including but not limited to human beings. When we speak about biological system, we speak about the whole planet, we speak about all the environmental change, we speak about the viruses, we speak about various things, and we speak about human beings included. So digital education 
traditionally would be a field which is concerned with what Professor Jinjing said, application of technology within a, an educational setting. Within this application of technology within the educational settings, there are some deep philosophical implications which were all like, identified actually by Professor Jing Jing, which are instrumentalism, which are a bit of technological determinism sometimes, and so on and so on and so on. So there is a, when you ask that you, when you say that you're doing digital education, you're not just using some kind of word and doing, you know, you are accepting a whole philosophical framework or whole philosophical background. Of course, it's not a unified philosophical background and many people actually see, have different views. So if you ask two different people to tell you about the, what would be digital education, they perhaps would not agree with each other. But still, it is a certain set of philosophical and other ideas which are kind of connected here. Now, when we speak about the post-digital, we speak about the specific set of beliefs, philosophies as well, which are non-determinist, absolutely non-determinist. So it's not that technology determines human behavior, and it's not that human behavior determines technologies, but the truth is somewhere in the middle. People create technologies, but then technology shapes shape people back, and so on, and so on, and so on. So also instrumentalism. Yes, this computer that I'm using now is a tool, but this tool that I'm using can be used in various purposes. And you can see that even people in this talk, when you take a look at your images, you know, there's, there's now on Zoom, there's, I see the poster and I see Professor Jingjing, Jing, then I see myself, then I see Heya, and sorry, I cannot read Chinese and your name is here, not in Latin letters. But anyway, so I see four names. And these four people appropriate technologies in different ways. Appropriate the ways how we present ourselves, the ways how we use this technology is different. So it's not the technology that determines what we can do. Technology determines, determines a bit, but then we decide about the rest. Now, the thing is that this complex view to relationships between people and technologies is implied in the concept of post-digital education. And the concept of digital education has a slightly different set of values and philosophies implied in it. So that would be the difference. It's not just about the word, it's about also something else. Maybe Professor Jingjing would have to have something to add. I mean, I, I'm interested in what you think. Professor Zhang? Well, if, if um, Professor Zhang, you are, you don't want to talk about, how about our next question here in the chat box? Uh, do you, both of you, think that our practices, educational practices during COVID, um, will ever fully replace our real life education, like something that uh, all of people try to imagine that we can just be everywhere and take courses and interact and magically learn all the hard stuff? Or do we have all go back to a classroom, a lab, um, a room where all of the books lies and produce knowledge in the old way? Uh, Professor? Uh, Shandrik, would like to start? Like, will the impact of COVID permanently change the pedagogy, the way people teach and education, the way people learn? Chen Shu, can you unmute Professor Zhang? She has some 
problem with our computer. Huh. I pressed the button, but there's no reaction. Right. Same here. Uh, 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 nothing's nothing's working. Right. Oh, okay. Right. Let's just wait a little bit for Professor Zhang uh, to solve her technical hiccup. You see, that's how we <laughs> that's how we have to deal with the hiccups. Currently. Yeah, of course, glitches yeah. they happen all mm -hmm. the time. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Kim Kaskone so, would have something about to say <laughs> to say about it. Yes, please go ahead. Sorry, I interrupted you. Right. Um, so, would you like to talk about um, earlier question by Tin? He asked whether the impact of COVID on education system, on the way we teach and learn is going to be permanent, will ever be permanent, or if it's not going to be immediately permanent that people have to go back to the classroom, will there be a day that we can be just a virtual and learning online? OK, thank you very much. Uh... It's a very important question. Uh, I will now share my screen just to, just to show you something. In, uh, in post-digital science and education, we recently, Sarah here and I and a few other of us, did this paper, which has 80 plus uh, testimonies of uh, teachers and students during pan the, the pandemic lockdown. And we asked people to write about 500 words about their experiences of the lockdown and teaching and learning with the lockdown, as well as to give us a photo of their working space. So this ugly, ugly picture that you see is actually the workspace that I'm working at right now. So if you can see it, I think it's still messy, but it's the same space, right? And then everybody else gave us their idea their, their feedback and they also showed us their spaces now here we have people from america china india malta we have people from 20 plus countries and these people from 20 countries have showed us all all continents all whatever people from all around the world have shown us their look at this one they have showed us their the environment they work in and also shared their experiences with us. And from what I can see, from what, what, I, what we can see from, this, from these testimonies, once that things start changing, they will never really go back as smoothly as they used to. So the idea is the return to the old normal, in my opinion, I think does not work. I don't think that we will be able to return to the pre-COVID situation without, without, and just, just, just begin then where we stopped and forget that there has been a year or two years, a few years of the pandemic in the meantime. So things will change. Now, yes, the pandemic does show us that the, that the, uh, uh, all problems with technologies, including this glitch that we have at the moment, but it also connects people. This is from China, I think. Uh, this is just, right. uh, yeah. Yes. Happy day, so it looks no, familiar. Yeah, it looks familiar, right? Right. So this is so. So what we have here is uh, the situation where 
you know, yes, there are bad things about these technologies, but there are also some really amazing things like Chinese, Croats, people from all over the world coming over here discussing those things. Yes, there are technical glitches, yes, that yes, there are problems, yes, there are hiccups and so on. But still, it's something that 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 gives us a lot. So I don't think that we will say that the digital is better than the face-to-face or the other way around. But I think that it will become more clear what is better for what, that we will get a clearer idea in the future when we will be able to meet face-to-face, that we will maybe be much more efficient in choosing the right, the right way of uh, look at the Look with these people, where this person is working, somewhere in the closet. So we will, we will, we will be able to choose better this situation where we will, where and how we will be able to to conduct our teaching, to conduct our learning, and in general to do stuff that we need to do. So yeah, this is I. I mean, I could talk about it for ages, but I think that I think that I answered the question. Uh, did Professor Jingjing manage to connect now? Yeah, so we can see her. Uh, okay, Professor excellent. Jiao, would you, <laughs> right. Um, would you like to make the last comment on our topic today? We're a little bit uh, over our time, but we can we can stretch a little bit, like two three minutes. Okay, so sorry about the te- technical problem. I think I'm. I'm opening too too many windows on my computer and it get, get crushed. Um, and I couldn't see the the question not now because I restarted my computer. But as far as I remember, uh, the team is asking whether an um, online learning is going to replace or not replace. So I think from my point of view, to because of those uh, not so good learning experience during the COVID nineteen. Um, and uh, online learning is not going to replace conventional education, that's for sure, because it's not replace or, 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 or kind of or make a change or revolutionary, right? Because you know, a lot of online learning initiatives has been seen as a disruptive like, like force to something, but it's, it's not happening. But, but I think it's going to be part of our life or of our future learning experience. Uh, why? It's because first, you know, for example, computers, we, we, we used to write our assignments, right? Like on papers. And when you first get to use computers to write, write articles or write your assignment, you, you're not really used to. You, I, I think at that point, you never think that uh, uh, this is going to change your writing styles or, or, or the writing habits, but, but it's happening. So practice is not going to change or replace dramatic, uh, uh, dramatically, but it's going to be changed gradually. That's practice because it will be informed by our perceptions towards something. So that's why I think the post-digital concept is really helpful. They are kind of reshaping or re- reconstructing people's understanding towards the relationship between technology and, and our social practice. And, and it's, it's going to be part of life is because like, like, like Peter was saying, so it's kind of like apple and pear. So, so it's not pears is going, are going to replace apples. You, you only eat, eat apples. So I think in the future, from my point of view, it will be part of it. So, so, so you actually as learners, uh, with, uh, consider your different like personalities or, or personalized learning experience, you can adapt or choose anything that works best for you at different time point or for different learning tasks, different activities. So they have different strengths and weaknesses, right? And also our human beings as social animals, we like face-to-face interaction. We just like to chat, like, like, like meeting people, right? Not, 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 not purely online, but, but it's going to be part of our life. Also, another reason is, you know, education is part of social, social, social practice. And apart from education, economics, our daily life is changing, right? A lot of people are buying stuff online, and then they were they were using a lot of those technology to 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 to, to consult their uh, to go to hospitals and to to taking the bus to call for the taxi, and so you 
your, your daily and social activities are changed. So those are also going to reconstructing your, your educational learning experience as well. So we're part of this big, big society and context. So, so those things together, I think as the complexity perspective really take us, it's going to change gradually, gradually, but not with as some, at some point it's going to replace our current or our mainstream education. So, so this, I think, last one point is because you know we're going to change, maybe not in our lifetime, but you need to be prepared, right? You, you should have an open mind, mind, mind open-minded, like, like those kind of things to, to know it's going to be changed and don't withhold yourselves. I, I, I think this is not good. I'm not going to experience, I'm not going to challenge myself, but, but be prepared, okay? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much again um, to everyone attending and to our two wonderful speakers and to Chen Shuo here as our co-host. And um, we are seriously over time or eight minutes over the time. Uh, for any further questions, please feel free to contact me at my email already there in the chat box. And we have to wrap it up, All right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Thank you very much for inviting me to this event. I hope, hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Great. Thank, you okay. Thank you. Thank you for our great two hosts. And thank you, Peter. Thank you for all the audiences who come and great question. Okay. We are going to use the two approaches to contact each other. After nice. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.